Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name's Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Tom Wagner. And today is a little bit of a bittersweet taping for us because today will be the final TV8 program with our good friend and Director of the Health and Human Services Department, Tom Agabrecht. Tom, welcome. Thanks, Adam. We were just talking a little bit off the air about the next chapter, and I know Tom's looking forward to that. But before he leaves us, we're going to learn a little bit about the Health and Human Services Department today. It's our largest department, one of 19, just under a $34 million budget. A lot going on, so much important work in that department. And Tom, please start by reminiscing a little bit. It's been about nine years with the mm -hmm. county, and you've had a tremendous run uh, reflect a little bit on what it's been like working for Sheboygan County the past nine years. Sure. Um, I've got, you know, four, four decades of, of service now in terms of human services. Ten, first ten years was spent in uh, private agencies in Milwaukee, and I've been involved in county government now for 30 years. So Sheboygan County for nine years, Brown County 11 years before that, and Manitowoc County 10 years prior to that. And I know, Adam, that during the time I worked in county government, when I had the chance to meet people from Sheboygan, uh, they were always down to earth, they were always gracious, they were always friendly. So I always had a high regard for the work being done in Sheboygan County, even before I landed here. So once the position opened up and I had a chance to apply, it piqued my interest. Um, I would say through that process, having a chance to meet you and now Mayor uh, Mike Vandersteen, who was county board chair at that time, Roger Otten, who's served on the county board for a long period and serves on our Health and Human Service Committee. E each of you were on that interview panel, and I remember it being, um, I would say, uh, more of a conversation than an interview. I left that interview hoping I'd have the chance to work for Sheboygan County. I remember my wife uh, reporting to me that she received a phone call from you uh, as, as you were preparing to make an offer. And she talked about how uplifting that was that has left a very, very positive you know, impression with her about Sheboygan County, about you, and about this place. And I would say that having had that opportunity, I've never looked back. Everyone I've met, everyone I've worked with has been extremely gracious, friendly. I've enjoyed it. I would say it has been the pinnacle of my career and on many levels my life as well. So I really appreciate being here. Wow. wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. And we are so grateful you've been here for the last nine years. There's a, a lot of your peers and staff, as you know, that are happy for you and Pam, but at the same time, and to dearly miss you. So thank you for sharing that. And I'm glad you, you ended with a county that you felt so good about. Absolutely. Yeah, wonderful. Well, focusing on the department and those roles and responsibilities, what is the mission of the Health and Human Services Department? And I know you have a number of staff uh, working in core mm -hmm. program areas. Give mm -hmm. us a little snapshot. Sure. So all counties uh, are responsible by statute for providing safety net services for people experiencing economic hardship, health issues, um, uh, safety issues. They might be, you know, uh, vulnerable and at risk of abuse or neglect. So all counties in the state are responsible for providing health and human service programs. And some counties do that in the form of several separate departments. We here in Sheboygan, and this is one of the things that has been a blessing for me, we have an integrated health and human services department. So some counties might have a separate department of public health, separate department of community programs. Here we're combined and we work under a mission of improving quality of life and self-sufficiency. And we do that through several programs, as you mentioned, and we do that through four separate locations. So our main building downtown across from Fountain Park in Sheboygan um, offers child protection, juvenile justice, behavioral health services, and our public health operations. Um, at the Job Center on Wilgus Avenue, we offer economic support programming. We have an Aging and Disability Resource Center in Sheboygan Falls, also known as the ADRC. So that operation provides information and assistance to persons 
who are aging or have disabilities who might be facing the need for long-term care. Um, and we also offer our senior dining program and adult protective services through that location. And then lastly, child support operations are located in the courthouse annex. And child support is uh, directed toward assuring that non-custodial parents participate in the financial well-being of their children. So there's a lot of work with the courts, so that location is very convenient for them. Yeah. Tom and I, we, we both now have been around the block for a little while, and, and Chairman Wagner was a school principal teacher, so he worked with a lot of good people, <clears throat> good co-workers. I've been here now 20 years, and I take such pride and pleasure in working with so many good people, good-hearted, passionate people. Mm -hmm. And though Health and Human Services may be one of 19 departments, when I think about your staff, I think it's just incredible the work they do, and the very challenging, important work that they do. And they are very skilled and working in a number of areas. Mm -hmm. Please touch on that a little bit. Talk about your staff and the different skill sets that you need to have a good sure. team. Absolutely. Yeah, currently we employ 189 individuals. Next year we're looking to add a couple more. Um, but the number is currently 189, and that staff comes to us from a variety of walks of life. So we have people that gravitate to working with us who come from the banking industry, from healthcare industry, from educational institutions. Uh, in some cases, many cases, our staff are fresh out of school, um, and in some cases, it's people that have worked for other counties and know a little bit about Sheboygan, much like myself, who gravitate to work here. So we employ, um, as I think about it, again, pretty diverse group of, of individuals. We've got secretaries, account clerks, accountants, uh, software professionals, business analysts, social workers, social service aides, doctors, nurses, uh, behavioral health therapists, and more. So uh, again, it takes all of those people working together to deliver the services that we do. I'd like to put in a plug also. Um, I love the fact that we are an employment source for many members of the community. And I would encourage anyone who would like to know more about health and human services to make a general inquiry. If we can offer information, guidance, or employment, I would love for us to do so. and. Um, Folks can make contact with our department by phoning our general uh, number at 459-3207 or send an email in care of human.services at sheboygancounty.com. And I'm confident that uh, whoever receives that message would be happy to speak with anyone about employment opportunity. Yeah. Well, nice overview. And as you said, just wonderful, caring, hardworking people, passionate about what they do, passionate about making Sheboygan County even a better place. And I've just really enjoyed getting to know your staff better over the years, wonderful people. And, and as we talk about a lot in, in county government, uh, not only good people, but it's about collaboration. It's about partnerships. Mm -hmm. And your department, perhaps more so than any, has a tremendous number of partnerships, both internally with other departments, but externally with other organizations, mm -hmm. nonprofit organizations. Please touch on that a little bit and why that's so important to be sure that we're providing good service. Yeah, you're right, Adam. Um, we do employ a number of individuals, but the work that we do would not be possible without those partnerships. And that exists in, in two different forms. Uh, in one, a formal contracted relationship. So we actually enter into contracts with over 90 separate organizations in the current year. And there's about $15 million invested in uh, those relationships. So when you think about our department, we provide some services directly, most specifically in the form of behavioral health counseling, and in some cases, public health nursing. But beyond that, at our core, we're a case management agency. So we assess needs, we make arrangement for services, we enter into contract for services, and those services can include group homes, job placement services, inpatient hospitalization, crisis response services, et cetera. Then the other type of relationship that we have is 
uh, with community partners in general outside of contracts, but certainly uh, no less important. And I would say that the relationships we've had with law enforcement locally have been exceptional. I can't say enough about our sheriff's department, our local police departments, and the collaboration and assistance we receive from them. Schools, we made mention to Tom and his background in education. Uh, schools are such critical partners for us. Hospitals, as I mentioned, uh, we work closely with the United Way on a number of initiatives. Um, and on balance, again, we, we would not be able to accomplish what we have been able to accomplish without those relationships. One example I could offer of, of that collaboration, and again, viewers might be interested, do an online search for Healthy Sheboygan County 2020. And you'll see some information there about the community agencies that have partnered with us and each other in the interest of assessing community health needs, in the interest of developing uh, health improvement plans. So we work with hospitals, agencies, school districts, United Way, in developing those plans every three years and setting a course that we collaboratively work toward. So I think that's an excellent example of the collaboration that you're describing. No one's paid to do that, no one has to do that, but this community comes together in the interest of doing that, and I think it's pretty special. I'd also like to make a brief plug. Uh, when we put our budget together annually, uh, we have a public hearing that's held every June. It's important to me, and I think it's important to our staff, that the work that we do be responsive to and reflect the interest and the needs of the community. So in June, there's a public hearing opportunity. Um, I'd love for us to receive feedback from the public about how we're doing, what we should be doing. So in the interest of that collaboration, not only is it important that we partner with agencies, but I think it's also about partnering with the people we're here to serve. And so far, it's been pretty successful. And you've been, and your staff have been, an outstanding listener. You do listen to the community. I think back to the community conversation years ago and hearing about all these programs and services, but we didn't have key people to coordinate it and make sure that they mm -hmm. were putting people in need in touch with the right organization. You responded to that. United Way with PATH, Welcome Baby, more recent initiatives. And the one that really comes to mind to me, Tom, is the Lakeshore Clinic the community clinic that mm -hmm. Kristen Blanchard Stearns is the executive director of. Wow. I mean, that's just an incredible success story for Sheboygan County. Mm -hmm. And it was our Health and Human Services Department, even uh, predating you with Ann Wonder Jim and Dale mm -hmm. Hippensteel, who wrote the grant mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. get that federal, yep. those federal dollars started. And now look at the needs that's addressing with dental care and other needs in the community. And our department was a part of that. So. Uh, you certainly can take pride in that, and your staff can take pride in it. And I know the county board does, because if it wasn't for the county board providing some of those seed dollars, some of those resources, support, those types of partnerships wouldn't have happened. So well done, and thank you. Thanks. Tom. Thank you, Adam. Um, welcome, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Spring County's budget, I, I think your Health and Human Services makes up about 23% of it, but not all of that is uh, a tax levy and that. I think your budget is around $34 million. Mm -hmm. So what percentage or what a dollar amount, if you if you know that, uh, is, is levy from the local property taxpayers? And then uh, what are your other sources of income? Sure. Yeah, you're right. We get exceptional support. Uh, again, working here, uh, it's been a gracious, uh, giving, supportive community. Uh, we do receive about $14 million annually in levy support, which is just about 40% of our budget. Uh, the vast majority of it then comes from uh, state and federal funding sources. So there's different grants, there's different appropriations that we receive, and about $4 million then comes from user fees. So um, if you need to reside in an assisted living facility through department sponsorship, those individuals would contribute a portion to that cost of care. So again, that's about $4 million annually. So those state and federal sources, we actually have 50 different funding sources that come in through our department. And they each have different uh, qualification standards, uh, different documentation standards, different reporting standards. Um, and that's where those secretaries and accountants and 
business analysts that I referred to earlier help us keep all of that organized, and it's no small challenge. Trust me, it's, it's a, a little bit daunting, but it's also a, a blessing in that we're diversified. You know, we have many sources of funds, so as things shift and change on any one front, we have the capacity uh, to, to think about and pursue correction uh, in other avenues. So it all works together. Right. You know, as, as a county board supervisor for the last 10 years and then being the chair for the last two and a half, it always strikes me as uh, relative, especially to the state and federal funding, mm -hmm. that those are constantly changing all the time, that your uh -huh. people have to be, you know, whatever was, well, might not be the next year or it changes yeah. and you're, you have to be extremely nimble from what I can tell. Yeah, you do have to be nimble, which is, which is sometimes a challenge, you know, working within a government process, and it's good, but it, it involves vetting, it involves decision making, it involves sharing of information. At the same time, the world is kind of changing very rapidly in the background. And, you know, as you, as you mentioned that, uh, I, I reflect on new staff that have joined us, and, and my advisement to them was it's going to take you two years to feel comfortable with what you're doing. And at two years, you're going to realize that you will never be comfortable, right. but you just kind of, uh, you know, acclimate to that kind of uh, mindset because it's very, very real. And if we can't change, we don't survive. Yeah, I would think so. I, on that note, just to follow up, I know we just received a notice from the federal government of a 300, about $375,000 on a, uh, for our treatment courts over, I think, the yes. next four years. So Yes. That, that would be one of those examples. We're very, very gratified to receive that. Uh, Jackie Maglowski, our behavioral health manager, wrote the application for right. those funds, so I'm very indebted to Jackie. And that's one of several that we receive in the course of work right. that we're doing. Well, uh, a lot of uh, things change, obviously, all the time. And as we talked about, you have to be nimble. What do you see for 2019 as far as some of the challenges that are, are out there for Health and Human Services? Yeah, the challenges for 2019 are not a lot different than what they've been for the last couple of years. So we talk about the opioid epidemic, we talk about drug treatment court, we've touched on children's mental health. Those continue to be kind of preeminent concerns, if you will. Uh, thanks for mentioning the grant we just received that is going to help us bolster our treatment court efforts. One of the things we have planned for the new year is adding an AODA counselor mm -hmm. who we expect to be working more closely with addicted individuals and partnering with our sheriff in the interest of diverting people from incarceration when treatment might be right. indicated or helping uh, inmates with community reentry following incarceration. So it's not enough to simply be released from those correctional settings. I think we have to pay attention to treatment needs, housing needs, employment needs, if people are truly gonna be successful. So we're adding resources on that front. Uh, we're also gonna add a couple of uh, therapists to our staff, uh, one to work more closely with the schools in the interest of kids who are experiencing crisis, who have deep end needs. I know it's a challenge for for educational facilities to try to figure out what's going on with kids. And sometimes the answer rests with those kids, sometimes with families, sometimes with schools, sometimes with communities. And so we want to get a better handle on that. So we're adding a therapist to help on that front. Um, we've pursued a, a path of becoming better informed about the impact of trauma in people's lives. So we're adding a therapist to help kids who've experienced horrific circumstances early in life, heal from those experiences and hopefully get on a better path moving forward. We're going to bolster child welfare services. Again, that area has seen the brunt of impact from the opioid epidemic. So we're adding a supervisor, not in the interest of more closely monitoring staff, but hopefully being a, a more ready resource for staff and guiding them through some of the complexities of cases that we're seeing. We're going to be contracting for in-home safety services in our child welfare arena. So we've seen an explosion in terms of out-of-home care in recent years. We need to do a little bit more to figure out if we can keep kids safe at home 
in lieu of out-of-home placement. And then lastly, I know that this has been a couple of years coming, but we're going to be able to expand some transportation services to rural areas of our county. Uh, we applied for grant dollars this year. We received notice. Hopefully, we're going to get a couple of vans yet at the end of this year that will prepare us for 2019 to offer, um, I guess, trips to folks living in rural settings. We've done a pretty good job in terms of medical transports. Mm -hmm. uh, this will bolster that and offer transports if someone needs assistance going to the grocery store or getting to other service facilities. We're looking forward to doing that. You talked about our, our child welfare. I know in our mm -hmm. child protect protective services mm -hmm. there's been just a I think you use the word explosion and then yeah. I hear from other counties too. So you want to just talk about that a little more why that is occurring? Do you sure. Think? Well, as I touched on, a good amount of that relates to the opioid epidemic. Um, over the course of the past seven or eight years, our numbers of children in out-of-home care has expanded by over 300%. So in 2010, I think we had 64 children in placement for the year. Last year, 219 in placement for the year. And uh, many of those circumstances relate to addicted parents or the presence of drugs in homes. I think through the first half of this year, um, out of the four to 500 calls that we've received for child protection involvement, we've had 113 children who've been exposed to drugs, whose parents are addicted, or who themselves might be addicted at birth. Uh, it's not uncommon for infants to be born to addicted mothers and to be addicted themselves. So 113 out of that group um, are facing those issues. So the way our child welfare system works, calls are screened in terms of is an investigation warranted, and then when investigations are done, there's either substantiation or closure of case. Those cases that are substantiated move to ongoing services, and out of 155 open cases, 100 of those cases are indexed to drug issues within our system. So when we've got those circumstances in homes, out-of-home placement for those children becomes kind of an important response. That's what's fueled the increase in that out-of-home care. So we've done a couple of things to try to address that. Number one, we have an opioid detox program that we're prioritizing access to uh, for any parents who are willing to change, willing to go through treatment, willing to go through detoxification. But then we've also partnered with the district attorney over the last couple of years um, to fund a special prosecutor in his office that will help us move toward termination of parental rights when parents aren't able aren't willing, aren't prepared to go down that path. So we prefer not to do that. I prefer to keep families sure. together. It's traumatic for kids to be separated from families, but at the end of the day, kids also need permanency. They have a right to a safe home, and if, if natural parents aren't able and willing to go there, the district attorney helps us pursue petitions in court for consideration of terminating those rights, which then allows those children to be right placed in adoptive homes. Right. And it's pretty hard to be a parent. It's hard, challenging to be a parent anyways, but to be a parent when you're addicted, yeah. it's a pretty tough, tough road Absolutely. for your children. So it's not just the addicted person, it's obviously the children who are suffering many Absolutely. times. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. Well, we do have a, a treatment facility, and mm -hmm. uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So in terms of opioid detox, um, we actually have a protocol within our department of administering a drug called Vivitrol, which helps reduce um, the cravings, if you will, uh, through addiction. So we're helping people through detoxification, and we do that through injection of Vivitrol. As I mentioned, we have a community-based residential facility that houses persons during their period of detox and we provide comfort medications to them. And then it's typical for individuals to go into a probably three month or so residential treatment program. And we've got contracts with a number of entities, much as I was talking about earlier, for, for uh, provision of that service. Following discharge from those facilities, those individuals would be enrolled in intensive outpatient programs 
through our guidance and uh, we're hoping to bolster that in the new year. One of the things we found is that not everyone is ready and prepared right. to, to step into treatment. So one of the additions we're looking at for the new year also is employing recovery coaches, people who themselves have gone through the battle, have right. headed on a path of recovery and might be able to assist us with outreach and, and support to the individuals who are considering getting enrolled in the program. Sure. Well, well, thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. Adam? Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Tom. <laughs> thank you, Matt. <laughs> Our viewers are following the Toms here. Uh, what a nice overview. So much going on at Health and Human Services. So many programs and services that your staff administer. Many of the challenges are ongoing. Many of them are new. And uh, it's just remarkable how many people you help and, and what's all in front of us. And as you reflect on the last nine years, if we just focus mm -hmm. on Sheboygan County and some of the key challenges that have come your way and some of the changes you've made, uh, what stands out to you are some areas that you know, fill you with pride or gratitude on what you and your team have been able to do? Probably first and foremost, and this is not one that's particularly uh, apparent to the community. Uh, it's nothing that you can look at on a spreadsheet and say, oh yeah, I see what that's all about. But the one that stands out for me that I think will provide the best return on investment over the long term is our embrace of becoming better trauma-informed as an agency. So um, the healthcare system, I think, is just beginning to understand and grapple with uh, the, the health impacts associated with adverse childhood experiences. So when kids have been through trauma, um, neurologically they're compromised, emotionally they're compromised, and we, for the past three years, have embarked upon an initiative whereby all of our staff are being immersed, immersed in better understanding about trauma and its impacts. So I think that'll carry the department and the county well into the future. Um, as part of that, we, we have to be more welcoming as an agency. I love the new addition mm -hmm. we've been able to put on our building. It is far more welcoming yes, and is. inviting than it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the community conversation on mental health 2014. One of the comments was it's difficult to access services. So we established information and assistance staff in our department to help people accessing service, whether it's through our department or elsewhere in the community. I think that's a valuable resource. Our drug treatment court, uh, the partnerships we've had with United Way, you touched on it um, in terms of Welcome Baby, Community Partnership for Children, the PATH initiative. Um, we've partnered in the region with other counties to expand mental health services and to develop a child advocacy center, and that is specifically Ozaukee and Washington counties the last few years we've partnered with to do that. Um, I think we've improved our business practices over my time here. We've been able to achieve um, nine consecutive positive budget uh, outcomes, and I'm very proud of that, uh, proud of the work that our staff are doing. And overall, I think that we just have an excellent team. Um, I'm not here to take credit for anything but to give credit uh, to the work that those guys are doing, and I think that the county is in great shape and will be for a long time to come. I'm so pleased to have been a part of it. We're so pleased you were here as well. It is bittersweet. In the last few seconds we have remaining, I just want to again say how much we've appreciated Tom's leadership and the tremendous value, vision, work ethic that he brought to Sheboygan County. You have built a stronger team. You have a wonderful team. And None of us are irreplaceable, but Tom is going to be tough to, <laughs> to replace. We're going to miss you, my friend. Hey, thanks, Adam. So it's thank you. It's a pleasure working here. Best wishes, Tom, and on behalf of the county board. Thanks, Thank Tom. you for all your work. You as well. Thank if you. you see Tom before he heads out, I think his last day is October 19th. That's correct. So I'm not quite sure when this will be aired, but if you get a chance to reach out to Tom and wish him well, please do. Hopefully we'll see him from time to time, but I know he's headed to warmer climate. <laughs> and please join us next month when we have our finance director, Wendy Sharnan, here to talk a little bit about our budget process, which is just about wrapped up and looking pretty good. A lot of teamwork. A lot of hard work has gone into the budget, but once again, we're poised to have a very modest 
property tax levy increase under 2%. And frankly, that's pretty remarkable when we get into the programs and services and demands we have. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tom Megabrecht. Best wishes. See you next month.